Okay, now this is a proper Shrek 3. We're smart and my He told me enough. No, I Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here, and I'm here with a brand new movie review, and this movie review is going to be for the fourth installment of this other review series I'm currently finishing up, and it's going to be for, it's the fourth and so far final installment of the main series, anyways, that we've been following since 2001, and it's going to be, and of course it's for the animated series, and this one is going to be for, of course, what is none other than 2010's Shrek Forever After or Shrek the Final Chapter, whatever you want to call it. But either title, this is the true Shrek 3, the proper one. But let's get on with the plot of this. Well, the one's hideous ogre Shrek played and is now living a good life with wife Fiona and has three children. But he soon has a meltdown in front of them and his friends during his kid's birthday party and he suddenly wants to be a real ogre like he was before he ever met Fiona. So, so he turns to the Debbie of Steel Mako Rumpelstiltskin for help. Now first Shrek lives the life he once lost and everything's going good, but seconds later he soon finds out that he has been set up by Rumpelstiltskin, who now rules the land with an iron fist. So he teams up with his alternate timeline friends Donkey, Fiona, and Puss in Boots, or a fat version of Puss in Boots, anyways. And a whole army of ogres. That this version of Fiona now leads. And Shrek is in for the fight of his life as he tries to get his life back before time runs out. So, how's this made? Well, we all know, because Shrek 2 was a massive success, originally three more Shrek sequels were going to be planned. And the fifth was going to be the final one. And they were announced in May 2004. In October 2006, DreamWorks announced the fourth would be released in 2010, three years after three. In October 2007, Kansas Burks announced the tell for the fourth film, which would be Shrek Goes Fourth. Because it would be explained that Shrek goes out into the world, fourth. Now, in May, thank God that title was not the title. In May, but then in May 2009, obviously because Shrek the Third got bad reviews, DreamWorks and Animation retitled the film to Shrek Forever After, and confirmed it would be the last of the Shrek series at that time. Then in November 2009, Bill Damaschgoth, head of creative production of DreamWorks Animation, confirmed that all that was loved about Shrek in the first film is bought to the final and fourth film. And Tim Sullivan was hired to write the script in March 2005, but was later replaced by Darren Lemke and John Clauser. And Clauser about the script's evolution, because when he first came to the project, he wasn't. it wasn't supposed to be the final chapter, obviously. It was going to be five Shrek movies, but about a year into development, Jeffrey Kasberg decided the story that they had come up with was the right way for Shrek's journey to end, which was incredibly flattering, and it was definitely for the best. Then in May 2007, shortly before the release of the fake third film, it was announced Mike Mitchell would be on board to direct the fourth installment, and much of the film was written and recorded in New York City. So yeah. After this film was shot and marketed, Shrek, premier Shrek Forever After premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, this time not Cannes, like the other three were, on April 21st, 2010, and was actually released by Paramount Pictures in the United States into theaters on May 21st, 2010. The film received, well, still not the same critical claim as the first two, sadly, but mixed reviews once again. However, more mixed to semi-positive. Definitely got better reviews than the previous film before this. And, it, and uh, unfortunately, it grossed even lower amounts than the previous film, with, but it was still a box office hit anyways, with $756 million worldwide, and it was still the fifth highest grossing film of the 2010. 
and it debuted as a top grossing film at the box office for three consecutive weeks in the United States and Canada. Now, as for my reaction, well, I remember not being too fond of this movie when I first saw it. I thought it was just kind of average, just mediocre, just not all that funny. Maybe I was just kind of getting to that maturity preteen age around this time, most likely, so maybe that was why. Maybe it was around the time when I was finally starting to see how bad Shrek the Third was. So maybe I was just hitting that age or something like that. But as the years progressed, I've gone to better appreciate this movie. And I now think it's a decently good third entry. So yeah, it's, my God, yeah, people can say it's a fourth entry. Guys, this feels like a much proper version of Shrek the Third we should have got. We should have had this in 2007. This should have been the third film. Why wasn't it? Like, if you literally cut Shrek the Third out of this whole franchise and skip right to this movie, you would miss nothing. They don't mention the events of Shrek the Third. Only things that literally even get referenced in Shrek the Third are just Shrek's kids. And just Harold not being there. There's no mention of Artie. There's no mention of Charming. There's no mention of any of the villains from Shrek the Third. There's no mention of the events of Shrek the Third here. None of that gets mentioned. At all. But it's still nowhere near the first two, greatness of the first two were at all. I guess at the time this movie came out, like maybe it was for the best that it was time to part ways with Shrek. And I'm glad they originally chose not to do a fifth one. But of course, no, thanks to Chris Mel Dondre from Illumination, their plan, they want to do a fifth one now. And it's all because of Chris Mel Dondre. I did like Puss the Last Wish, but guys, just because I liked Puss the Last Wish, just because I liked Puss the Last Wish, that doesn't automatically mean I want a Shrek 5. It did not, it still did not make me want a Shrek 5. I still don't want that to happen. Regardless. The Last Wish I can just accept as an epilogue. You'll find out more in that review. But Shrek Forever After is a surprisingly decently good film. Not as great as Shrek or Shrek 2, but an improvement over previously what was supposed to be the fake third installment. This movie like helped the franchise gain some of its heart back that was lacking in the previous film and had some terrific action scenes. The first time I saw it, I didn't think it was very funny, but when I went back to see it, went back and watched it a second time late years later, I laughed much more this time. And it even teaches an important lesson that if you have a good life, you should not give it up for anything. If Shrek had never met Fiona or any of his friends, they would have all had rough lives. And Shrek the Ogre, like pretty much in this movie, Shrek the Ogre was once fear for land, lives an ordinary life with his wife and children now. But he misses his old life, and during his children's birthday party, he just storms out angry. But then he rescue, sort of rescues evil Rumpel Stiltskin, and they talk and said he would like just one day of his old life back. And Rumpel says he could give him that in exchange for one other day in his life, a day he can't even remember. And Shrek can't see any cash so signs the deal, but he finds himself in an unfamiliar world. At first, it seems great, everybody fears him again, but he realizes there's something very wrong. He's captured by witches seconds later, who take him to the castle in a cart pulled by an alternate donkey who has no memory of Shrek. And at the castle, he finds that Rumpel now rules the place. And he's told that the day he gave up was the entire day he was born, and after the one day he asked for, he will cease to exist for good. In this world, he was never born, so he didn't befriend Donkey, he didn't befriend Puss, he didn't rescue Mary Fiona, and the king and queen were tricked into a deal successfully that gave the king to Rumble Stiltskin and he killed them both. All hope isn't lost, though, because there is a get-out clause, True Love's first kiss will save him from ceasing to exist. But it's not going to be easy, though. He will not only have to find Fiona, he will have to make her fall in love with him once again all in one day. And in some ways, remember Clark Street from last year? You could somewhat consider this the actually good Clerks 3. The prof done the proper way. The tone of Clerks 3 actually done properly. Because for one, yeah, this movie is depressing and dark. It's the darkest of the main Shrek films, but it's not overly pretentious. And it's still a comedy movie. This movie still had comedy in it. So the depressing stuff didn't ruin the movie like Clerks 3 did. And it wasn't just a nostalgia fan service. This movie actually felt like a proper movie. It felt like a proper sequel. And it felt like a perfect send-off for the characters. 
and it does not kill off the lead, and it actually still gives, well, maybe it still almost does, but it decides to give the lead a happy ending and still lets them live. Because, yeah, this is definitely the second darker Shrek movie because the story is definitely much darker than the last three times. And we see Shrek actually make the worst mistake of his life that costs him everything he holds dear and then could potentially cost him his own life. And it adds a sense of urgency to proceedings and makes each step forward towards fixing things satisfying and a big countdown there. And the fact that Shrek hasn't impacted their lives yet means familiar characters have changed. Fiona, because she pretty much ended up escaping the tower on her own, becomes a warrior princess leading an ogre rebellion against Rumpelstiltskin and Puss is now all fat, like Fat Thor in Endgame. And Rumpelstiltskin is still the most villainous of the antagonists of the Shrek films to date. Well, the main, sh the main Shrek films anyways. The main series, not... I know the spin-offs have one antagonist that's more threatening than Rumpel, but this is for the main series. The ones that star Shrek. Yeah, sure, like... I mean, yeah, Death in Last Wish is definitely more menacing, but that's for Puss in Boots' stories. Talking about the Ogre stories and his alone in this review. And Shrek Forever After succeeds where Shrek the Third fails because it returns to the charm of its characters and its story. Shrek the Third just relies more on visuals, hit and miss pop culture jokes that aren't funny, and stunt casting, than on creating a strong story for in taking its characters on an entertaining, interesting journey. Shrek Forever After reflects on all these mistakes. The pop culture gigs are less this time around and far in between, and most of the film's humor coming from characters and their situations, and there's, and there's less of the crude jokes than this one. There's no obvious stunt casting here, but that works to the film's advantage, like... And honestly, Walt Dorn here really stole the show as a tricky Rumpelstiltskin. This vocal performance was a blast to Snibley Ravistas, and new director Mike Mitchell and screenwriters Josh Clare and Darren Lemp actually do funny new things with familiar characters, like... Whereas Puss in Boots was a swarthy swashbuckler, in this alternate universe, he resembles as fat as a balloon covered in fur, can't move without it being an Olympian task, like one more where he's literally struggling to lick himself or struggling to get up after getting onto the pillow, and then drinks this bottle of milk, and says he has all the mice he can chase, but a mice comes up and kicks some of his milk. Puss decides to just let the guy live, and they both drink their milk together, so he decides not to kill the mouse anyway, <laughs> because Puss probably knows it's going to be a chore with all this, this version of him's weight. And pretty much he says, I'm not Puss in Boots anymore. Pretty much, so yeah. He's now like Fat Thor, basically. And now, whereas Fiona's this tired housewife in Shrek's real universe, in the alternate universe, she is this, like, really tough rebel leader, an aggressive one, of the ogre resistance against Rebel Stiltskin, who has no interest in romance. Mitchell, Klaus, Mitchell, Klaus, and her lens really have a lot of fun twisting our expectations of what the characters would do and what will happen to them. And I have a lot of fun with these new versions of the characters. There's kind of, like, one death scene which comes out on midfield, and it's somewhat hilarious as well. And the vocal work is strong here. Like, Mike Myers really excels here as Shrek. He brings his real sense of human weariness and sarcastic wit to a fairy tale character, and it grounds him in reality. And Shrek's midlife struggle with the loss of the spark of his life before he met Mephiona will ring true with many viewers. Many people who are in the middle of a marriage will definitely look back on their freer days with a sense of nostalgia, wish they could relive them for one day in their life again. And Shrek's falls that he doesn't realize what he has until he loses it. Cameron Diaz excels in both personalities, a terrible loving wife, and a xeno like warrior, the latter which she particularly seems to be letting loose and having a lot of fun, and Murphy and Banderas as their usual hilarious selves, both of them taking advantage of the characters in their new situations, with Banderas relishing his character's pampered lifestyle as Fiona's pet, and Murphy still getting big laughs out of his chatterbox sidekick. And another thing here, there's this nice throwback to the first one. Remember the first one when Shrek and Donkey first met, and Shrek was constantly just trying to get Donkey to leave him be? and Donkey kept bothering him. This one, when Shrek meets the alternate Donkey, he keeps trying to convince Donkey he's his best friend, but Donkey keeps trying to run away from him. So it's nice, so it does solidify Shrek's character developments in their French, in his friendship with Donkey right here. Right here, and now that pretty much the roles are reversed and the tables are turned here. So there's some decent character development right there with the two. But this is an alternate timeline, obviously, but still. And the supporting cast is even filled with talented actors who are not wasted. Like, got Craig Robinson voicing one of the ogre, rebelling ogres, Jane Lynch voicing one of the rebelling ogres, and John Hamm voicing one of the rebelling ogres. And they don't feel wasted, even if their roles aren't huge. They don't feel wasted like Shrek 3's celebrities were. Right here, they actually do get some decent work. 
And the animation here is beautifully done and highly detailed, and I think this one is the best uh, best animation of the whole series. It, this movie still even continues to be funny, charming, inventive, and heartfelt. I felt the relationships of the characters became stronger in this movie and it had more of a cinematic dramatic tone rather than just being a long sarcastic farce. There's still plenty of silliness and dark humor in this one though. No, like more importantly, the movie even did address an issue with the past movies. Like, did you ever have trouble buying that Shrek the Lonely Grumpy Ogre and suddenly become a happy family man after meeting Fiona? Like in this movie, he confronts the contradiction and is faced with the question of what really matters to him. Whether he can really embrace this new life or if it goes against who he really is. And the real treat of the premise is that forever after, it gives us a chance to warm up with these characters all over again and recall why we love them in the first place, and then find out a few of the reasons to like them all over again. We know these characters, we've met them before, and this might just serve as a reunion one final time after the occasional slog of the previous follow-up. And unlike its immediate predecessor as well, this one has a storyline instead of the simple premise to be used to hang pop culture references and in-jokes. Not a great storyline, not really an original storyline, fine, but it's a step on the right direction here. Like, Mike Mitchell at least put Shrek right back on track, and not a moment too soon. So it is nice, so it's definitely agreeable when some people say this movie saved the Freck Shrek franchise. Because, honestly, maybe there is one good thing that came out of Shrek the Third, because if Shrek the Third had not made such a huge profit and got this much hype, I don't think we would have had this better film. So, Shrek the Third at least managed to make a profit so we could still have this better movie. In addition, this movie even works as a family domestic drama where it maturely deals with the simple family issue of boredom and being sick of how repetitive his family life can be. And the film can sometimes work as a satire and a metaphor that some married men can learn from. There's one sequence in the movie that really captures the crisis, and that's where Shrek realizes that despite the fact he does live a happy life, it could get dull and annoying at times, but then again, that is kind of life. And it does become boring at times because many of us choose just not to grow up. Many of us choose not to let go of what our past lives were. And that's what happens to Shrek exactly in this movie. Escape the mediocrity of a family life, he wishes to relive the moments when he was still just a normal ogre again. And he puts his family life in jeopardy, but then realizes his mistake, fixes it, and decides to just let his old life go for good. And Shrek's fourth hill comes full circle in the sense that it questions if Shrek did have a happily ever after, ending in the past three movies, and puts one last fantastic circumstance to live out reality that this never happened, then regain it, and finally gain the proper happy ending for good. And lastly, Shrek 4's main potential lies in its romance. Like, with an alternate reality story, Shrek faces a Fiona that's never met him, has no interest in him, and Shrek must find out some way to make Fiona fall in love with him all over again and change her mind. And this romantic aspect of this movie, if you ask me, is as innovative as the first movie was. It tells the mature subject matter in the goals of fantasy, and if you wanted the alternate reality mirrors the play of the women who gave up on romance, and one scene certainly negates the f the, f the face of the of most fairy tale elves with a line that goes something like, a mere kiss does not solve everything, and it negates other fantasies like Steven Beauty or Snow White because it destroys the superficial aspect of those obsolete fairy tales with a more realistic approach, because... A kiss is nothing if there is no true love that goes with it, and Shrek 4 su succeeds in this aspect. And how the whole finale goes of this movie? Well, y'all know, Shrek finds this whole rebelling army of ogres that are planning to ambush Rumpelstiltskin, but, but Rumpelstiltskin has already arranged a bounty hunter known as the Pied Piper to lead them to his castle to capture them, and the and we get a pretty much a funny moment where the Pied Piper play, pretty much plays Shaker Groove thing on his flew and leads the ogres all the way to his pl to Rumpel's place. Here, but Shrek and Puss manage to save Fiona and Donkey, but, I mean, no, manage to save Fiona and Shrek, and Donkey and Puss manage to save Fiona and Shrek before they can be led there. They fall into the water. Shrek believes that the Trilla's first kiss can, can kind of solve her curse, but she tries that, and it doesn't work, and so she storms off, and Shrek realizes he's never going to get his life back here. And... But, and of course, Rumpel finds out Fiona and Shrek are now together, though, sadly. And, well, and then arranges this bounty hunt for Shrek. Jinji does find him and tries to turn him in, but before Shrek can get some answers from him, Puss pretty much eats and kills this version of Jinji because, well, this Puss is a foodie. It's not the Puss in Boots we know. It's like, you're going to eat that, and but... But, yeah. And Shrumpel did offer a wish to anyone who brought in Shrek, but nobody brings him in successfully. Like, all we get is 
not Shrek, not Shrek. This this obnoxious boy that we saw in the earlier movie that keeps the man Shrek do the rock repeatedly, which is kind of an annoying character. They bring in this troll that doesn't even look remotely like an ogre. The three pigs just bring in the wolf disguised as Shrek. And Rumpel's like, that's just sad. Yeah, because that's that's not Shrek. That's just trying to bring in the wolf disguised as Shrek just to get a free reward. And then, of course, Pinocchio literally brings in his father disguised as Shrek. <laughs> well, and if you watch the first film, you remember this... That so-called father just pretty much sold him to Farquaad. So that showed what a great dad that guy really was. So you could, because if this was the same timeline, you guys could literally consider that as revenge for his father just pretty much stabbing Pinocchio in the back in the first film at that auction scene where he basically just sold his own puppet for money. So you can consider that as Pinocchio. So at least you can somewhat say in this timeline, Pinocchio got his revenge. In a way, it could be good karma for this version of Geppetto. But Shrek then turns himself in, and Rumpel's forced to grant Shrek's wish. And instead of wishing his life back, he wished he decides to make that sacrifice and by freeing the rest of the ogres. But then, the, but then Shrek gets locked up, and Rumpel still goes back on the deal and does not release Fiona because she's not all ogre. And Donkey puts in the freed ogres and storm the castle. And before they do, though, Fiona is amazed that Shrek made the ultimate sacrifice for her friends and army. And then the put Donkey puts in the freed ogres storm the castle. They capture Rumpel and they defeat his witch army. And Shrek and Fiona take down this alternate version of Dragon that has no interest in falling in love with Donkey at all. And then the sun rises. But then, of course, because his day is up, Shrek begins to fade from existence. And Fiona, having fallen in love with him, just kisses him just before he disappears. And, and honestly, this like this, I feel like this moment right here gets much more emotional as as I get older. Right here, like, like it just. It becomes a pretty bittersweet moment right here where he pretty much mentions the best part of this day was you get that he got to fall in love with Fiona all over again. Like watching this now, this scene just brings a tear to my eyes every single time right here. But of course she does, she kisses him before he disappears and his day can be fully up and he can, before he can fade from existence completely and seeing that she's still an ogre in the sunlight, Fiona realizes her curse was broken, and she assumed true love's first love's true form. And the alternate reality disintegrates, showing that the whole kiss worked, and it saves Shrek's life, and it takes Rumble Silskin with it while everyone else disappears. And Shrek finds himself back to the original timeline the moment before he lost his temper at the party, but instead of lashing out again, Shrek instead embraces his family and friends with a newfound appreciation for them, and we get this great mo moment between Shrek and Fiona right there. You know, I always thought I rescued you from the Dragon's Keep. You did, no. It was you that rescued it was you that rescued me. And that's where the movie ends. This was a great way to complete Shrek's journey. He realized he never actually did rescue Fiona. Fiona was actually the one who rescued him from his unhappy moments all along. And it's a perfect spot to end Shrek's story right there. Could have never picked a better place to end it. But no. Let's make a Shrek 5 anyway. Because Last Wish made profit, we're going to make a Shrek 5. And we're probably going to fuck up this ending. We're probably going to fuck up the, the, the Last Wish's ending, too. The Last Wish's ending, I'll get to in that review, but... And you'll find out why I still don't want a Shrek 5 in that review. However, yeah, I can agree there's still nitpicks, like... Like, this movie does... Some people seem to call this a comedy, but I think this movie would work better as a fantasy adventure movie than a comedy because most of the humor factor we know in the Shrek movies is gone in this one. The movie seems to squeeze the very last drop of what is left of the Shrek series is dried out, desert of humor. And it may give us a, a chuckle here and a chuckle there every once in a while, but this Shrek movie doesn't make as many people laugh in this one. When you look back at the title Shrek the Final Chapter, you realize that this movie does seem to apologize for the fact that this will be the last and probably the... Last, what was going to be the last admission that they could not squeeze out any more decent of the Shrek saga of this one, with the exception of the Puss in Boots spinoff we got the year after this. It's a final effort to make one last quick buck for the main storyline, 
but it does work out in the end. And this movie often is kind of a bit of a don't duff to the It's a Wonderful Life attempt because it has the same cliches as those knockoffs, but, and the ending is honestly predictable because you know Shrek's not going to die. You, people, do people think Shrek would die in this movie? Like, why would they kill off Shrek? Kids love Shrek. They're not gonna. They're not gonna kill off Shrek in the franchise like this. I don't think they would do that. Like this is not it's like Shrek's not done by Kevin Smith. This is not a Kevin Smith attempt with Clerks Three. At all. And another thing about that, Shrek Forever After has a fifty-eight percent of Raw Tomatoes. Clerks Three has a sixty-four <laughs> percent. You gotta be fucking serious. Somehow, Clerks 3 is a slightly better movie than this. This movie is a better version of that poor sequel. Because unlike Clerks 3, which has no funny scenes, this movie still tried to be funny. And the depressing tone didn't drag down the movie, and it wasn't obsessed with having a dark, depressing tone. And you can see why Shrek would be kind of an asshole in this movie, unlike with Randall. Shrek didn't, Shrek didn't treat many people like shit in this movie and kill them like Randall did with Dante. And Shrek didn't die at the end of this movie pathetically like Dante did. And it did not pull an Alien 3 cliche on Fiona like it did with Becky and her baby. Now, and although the animation is a notable improvement over the first Shrek films, there's very noticeable moments in the film where the facial or physical movement of the characters feels very artificial or unnatural, being more evident in characters that are in background or extras, and at the same time, the environmental aspects such as landscapes, the kingdom of far, far away, forest, dragon castle, and sky kind of feel poorly polished, being more similar to those of a video game, and not to mention that like Shrek the Third uses palette colors that's somewhat unpleasant, or repeating the colors of dark yellow, dark orange, red, and natural yellow, and rather, and some, there's still some of the inappropriate and cringeworthy dialogue here, like, I'm being ass-napped, which is kind of a gross line. It's said by Donkey, like the alternate version of Donkey, anyways. And, and of course, there's my donkey fell in your waffle hole, which is kind of a gross line as well. And some attempts of humor are just sometimes nonsensical or cruel, like, when Shrek is about to interrogate Gingy and Puss eats him, which is kind of a funny moment though, but still. And then Shrek suggested to Rumble that he erased the day he met Donkey. Like, dude, Donkey's how you got all these great moments of life. Donkey's kind of how you met Fiona in the first place. And the first and this Donkey was the first person who never even judged your appearance. And the film can be a little bit rushed at times. Too. Like, the pace of the film does switch a lot, even more than the previous movie. Like, considering how many feel the whole premise in an alternate reality could that only exists for one day could have been more explored if it had not been the rather short runtime of the film. And it's never explained as to what happened to Fairy Godmother in an alternate reality or Prince Charming. And it's also even implies that Lord Farquaad died in an alternate reality as well, but... But even though, like, literally, Shrek never met anybody there, wouldn't Farquaad still be alive? And still ruling Duloc to this day. And I think Charming was going to appear, but he was cut. Was probably killed by a dragon. Knowing that Charming was kind of a little son fairy godmother and treated like a baby, though. But if Fiona escaped the tower, wouldn't Charming still be alive? Some of those just never get explored. But it's very likely Dragon likely killed Charming before Rumple captured Dragon. And some false advertising, too. Like... The Gigi from the alternate universe is shown in many of the film's posters, but he has little to nothing to do in the film. Aside from convincing Shrek of Rumpelstiltskin's offer of a lifetime, before he gets killed by Puss. But other than those movies, I mean, other than those bad qualities, I decently still enjoy Shrek for a Raptor, and it's a good cap-off to the Shrek series, and I really wish this was the last to feature Shrek himself, to be about Shrek himself. The two spinoffs I can live with, but... And when it comes to having a donkey spinoff, I've, yeah, I've heard they want to do a donkey spinoff, but... I'm not sure how I feel about that. I love donkey as a character, guys, but... Making movie, making two movies about Puss in Boots is one thing. But... A film about donkey? Eh... 
Donkey's a good character, but I don't think he works for a movie about him. Donkey just kind of works best as a comic relief. Since he and kind of overly talks too much, so I don't know if a movie about Donkey kind of overly talking a lot would kind of work. So, you can, I can see why they make films about Puss in Boots, though, but not so sure how I feel about a Donkey spinoff, or a film about Donkey himself. Because Donkey just works best as a comic relief. That's what I think for the Donkey spinoff, if you guys were going to ask me that. But in the end, Shrek Forever After is a worth watching buy for those fans that want a better third entry after the disaster that was Shrek the Third. Anyways, that's it for my view of Shrek Forever After. If you're wondering how I'm going to rank Shrek Forever After, here's how I'm going to rank this movie. So overall, if you are a fan of Shrek who hated the third film and want a better third entry that properly wraps up this franchise, then I'm going to give this a decent watch and buy for you. And if you're wondering how I'm going to rank Shrek Forever After, I'm going to give Shrek Forever After a 7.5 out of 10. There we go. That wraps up my review for Shrek Forever After. And that wraps up the main series. But the series is not over yet, because we got two. We got, we got those two Puss movies I need to do. So I'll rewatch the first Puss in Boots, then I'll rewatch The Last Wish next week, and then I'll do those two reviews next week to finish off June. To finish off complete June. Right there. So yeah, can't wait to do those ones. Right there. And I know some of my subscribers are DreamWorks Retired, but I'm not 100% DreamWorks Retired just yet. Because after two films last year, we'll see how their original stuff goes. Granted, I'll definitely be skipping Trolls 3. I'll definitely be skipping Kung Fu Panda 4. I like Kung Fu Panda guys, but we don't need a fourth one. I'll definitely be skipping that live-action Howard Train Dragon remake that nobody wants. But let's just see. I just I'll just wait and see how the original stuff goes. I'll just play it out by word before I even decide my retirement. So I'll just wait and see how the original stuff goes. I'll likely just I'll probably likely skip quite a few of their sequels, but when it comes to their original things, let's just see how the actual movie goes. So and plus, DreamWorks has not gone woke yet, so... At least, unlike Pixar and Disney, so... There's maybe that, but... Let's just, I'll just play it out by word. And until then, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank you all for watching. If you like this and want to see more, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Don G. Corleone.